Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tom Sheehan again from Northeastern University in Boston. I want to welcome you again to the SAGE uh, webinar series. And we're really pleased today to have uh, Professor Stephen Skypers from uh, Marine and Environmental Sciences here at Northeastern University um, to speak on uh, sustainability on cr crowded coastlines. Um, Dr. Skypers uh, graduated with a PhD from the University of South Alabama and also the Dolphin Island Sea Lab in 2012. He was an, NS an NSF uh, CIS fellow, uh, which is a prestigious fellowship uh, granted to those that are doing the kind of work that, that Dr. Skypers has been, has been focused on. And we're very pleased here at Northeastern that he joined us as an assistant professor uh, this fall. Uh, and, and if his slide isn't enticing enough to get you to listen, I'm sure uh, uh, his talk will be terrific. So at this point, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Skypers and let him begin his presentation and uh, with the title of Pursuing Sustainability Along Crowded Coastlines, Lessons from Ecological Experiments and Homeowner Experiences. And uh, Stephen, I'll let you take it away. Okay, uh, I think I successfully unmuted myself. Thank you first, uh, Dr. Sheehan, for the, the really kind introduction and uh, invitation to be part of your, your seminar series. Um, uh, obviously, from the, the topic I've got here, I, I've kept up close with what the project's been going, and it's been exciting to see it develop and, and now to get to participate. Um, so the, as I was putting this talk together and, and as I've recently been presenting on these topics, this picture has kind of emerged as my, my background first slide every time. And it's because I really think I could give the entire talk just by, by describing this image uh, on, on some of our work along coastlines and some of the things that, that seem to be emerging in lots of other places. And that's largely because I think it nicely sums up some of the complex human and environment interactions that occur along our coastlines. If you notice in the back where the cars are crossing the interstate here, uh, this is a major interstate system uh, crossing a bay, uh, actually Mobile Bay down in coastal Alabama. And this image is taken from a causeway that, that's a little bit south, uh, actually from the balcony of a restaurant looking down on this marina. But what you have to look a little bit closer to see is around the fringes, you've still got a lot of marsh left. So you've got pretty intense development, yet a lot of the natural ecosystem still in place. Uh, in addition to being right in the middle of a marina where you're going to have a lot of boat action. And the reason that this is the case is because it was well designed. It was strategically designed with some of the features that you can see, such as what looks to be a wood picket fence uh, down submerged in the water, which is designed to protect the marsh from some of the wave energy from the boats. And so obviously this place draws a lot of human recreational activity and has been able to retain, at least from what we can see, a lot of its ecological integrity. And so this is the balance that, that we really seem to be striving for along our coastlines as we develop uh, in the ways that we desire as a society and having as, as small of an uh, environmental impact as we can. And so this is kind of the topic today of, of where we've gone in the ways we develop our coastlines through time, where we're at uh, now, and, and hopefully uh, where we need to go in the future. But very, uh, well, let's see, there we go. Um, very few places along our coastlines look like that image in the last picture. More often than not, when we visit our coasts, we see places like these four. We see major uh, transportation hubs, super crowded beaches. Our coastal cities have dramatically transformed what ecosystems look like to where there's often only small patches of natural habitat or marsh left. And then in a lot of places, our fisheries have increasingly become industrialized to where they have major impacts on, on our coastal systems. But what we're really starting to focus on uh, as the linkage between these systems is how we directly manage the shorelines. And this is the, a topic that I've worked on quite a bit, as well as uh, a number of folks out here at our Marine Science Center in the hunt, as well as the, the groups on campus. This set of images here shows some of the more common shoreline types that we see along our coastlines. It's from uh, a recent paper by Dr. Rachel Gitman, who's one of the 
postdoctoral fellows out here at the lab and has done a lot of work on living shorelines and coastal armoring, um, looking at a lot of these ecological issues. And so you can see here across the top, you've got vertical seawalls and bulkheads, which are really common and prominent structures along our coasts. Revetments, uh, you'll hear me talk a little bit about, is that B column where you can see uh, the rocks along the coastline. A mosaic of a, of a marsh and a rocky sill in, in panel C. And then your more traditional rocky coast beaches and marshes across the bottom. And understanding how these different shoreline types uh, impact our ecosystems are, are, is important beyond just being a scientific question. 127 million people live near coastlines. Um, it's a major issue for most coastal managers is looking at how these coasts erode and how sustainable they are. And it's tremendously expensive uh, at a national level and as well as for the waterfront residents who live along these coasts who worry about dealing with the coastal hazards that threaten their um, sustainability. One of the things that I think um, aligns nicely with this stage or uh, the initiative and the work that you guys are doing is that our coasts are also gradients from very high urbanization. We've got lots of major cities. In the map in the middle, you can see all of the cities with over a million people. These are almost all scattered along coastlines. But we also have highly rural areas where a lot of agricultural still goes, uh, agriculture still goes along, uh, along our coastline. And so understanding how this impact of development across this urbanization gradient is something that, that we also have to think about as we look at these different shoreline types, how they're distributed, uh, and what types of impacts they have. In the United States, we're, we're getting a, a really good handle on what this looks like in practice, where these structures are, where are the places that have retained a lot of their natural shoreline, and where are the places that have had the most development. And so this is another recent paper by uh, Rachel Gitman and a group of colleagues where they looked at publicly available shoreline data at the county level in the U.S. and highlighted that in places like Boston, we reach up to 94% in the mass bays areas. And in places that are even with far lower population levels like Mobile Bay, um, which I'm going to show you some, some of our work from um, on the ecological and social side, you get closer to 40%. And there's been a, a, a bit of work I'll show you later where we tried to understand what predicts these places that have preserved more of the natural environment versus places that have had higher levels of armoring. But this is not just a problem uh, in the U.S. or a trend in the U.S. This is a global issue where as our, our coastlines are developing, all of those cities uh, distributed along our coasts are often coincided with transitions or changes to the shoreline. This is a recent article from Science within the past couple of years that highlighted uh, efforts in China to reclaim a lot of wetlands and build a massive seawall sea along the coast, uh, which is important to understand, too, because one of the things we've learned as we've studied this legacy of shoreline armoring, which has been our traditional way of protecting coastlines, is that not all structures are the same. Depending on the type of structure we put on the shoreline, that's going to change the human outcomes and the ecological outcomes. And particularly, the decision to install these vertical walls has been something that we've increasingly realized how harmful it is. The presence of this vertical wall structure, and, and what you've got here in the picture on the left, is a series of residential scale bulkheads. I think they, they're, they're wood, and this is in Mobile Bay, Alabama, uh, from a study all the way back in 1999, where they were looking at the historic development of this system and showed that as the population of the two coastal counties increased, pretty much along sequence with that, so did armoring along the shoreline. And this type of armoring uh, with a vertical structure fundamentally changes the way our, our ecosystems um, are structured and how they function. So if you look at the image up in the right corner, you can see that when you take what was naturally a sloping shoreline and you install this vertical feature, you no longer have anywhere for the waves to crash on the shore. Now they're just reflected back into the bay. And this changes the, the slope of the shoreline to where you no longer have that, that slope. Now you have what a lot of engineers and, and the Douglas and Pickle paper coined 
was uh, you turned a bay into a bathtub. So you've built these features that now you just have wave energy bouncing back and forth and um, causes erosion down the structure, which as ecologists have demonstrated, this washes away a lot of the critical intertidal habitat. So moving from how these structures impact the environment to how they impact the uh, ecology of things that live nearby, we're making that leap to then be able to say, how does this change the broader ecosystem? Uh, this is something that has been documented for probably the past 20 years as we've started to study more of urbanized systems and how they compare to natural e ecosystems. And the benefit of that is we're now reaching a point in our understanding where we can synthesize and we can say things generally, like generally in the big picture, how do these types of structures impact uh, the ecology of a bay? And a third recent paper by Rachel Gitman and, a, and another group of us uh, from the Marine Science Center in North Carolina has shown that the relative abundance of most organisms that you find along coastlines are going to decline as you transition from natural shorelines, so the marshes and the beaches and the oyster reefs and those types of habitats, and transition them into these vertical seawalls. And this is purely a consequence of those natural habitats being washed away. You've taken what was something very structurally complex and productive like a marsh and replaced it by something that is far less complex uh, like a vertical wall. And so in this case, it shows that plants, the, the in fauna that live in the sediments, birds, the types of organisms that attach to structures, and then all of your fish, shrimp, and crabs are all generally lower. In addition to seeing these big overall patterns, so the general trends, um, one thing we've also learned about this type of decision is that it can change the resilience of a system to fluctuations through time. So the types of communities, whether these be, in our case, fish, that you find associated with different shorelines. And in, in this particular uh, example I'm showing you here, we looked at natural shorelines in panel A, um, riprap revetments in panel B, vertical walls in panel C, and then a combination of a hybrid scenario in, in panel D with the vertical wall and the uh, uh, riprap revetment. And we studied how fish communities fluctuated across an 11-year period and showed that along natural shorelines, you had tremendous consistency throughout the entire period of time. The number of species and the composition of all these fish were pretty similar. In the same bay, as you got into areas where there were more uh, artificial structures of these other three types, you got much you, you uh, decreased in predictability or stability. It became much more noisy and things were, were far less predictable. If you uh, notice a few things in this graph, the 2006 year, um, everything changed. Everything became much more similar. This study was focused on Mobile down in the Gulf that I, I showed you the picture from. And this was the year following uh, a very, very active hurricane season with hurricanes Katrina, Rita, and Ike, I believe. Ivan, actually, it was Ivan. And then 2010-2011, uh, this is the region that experienced the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And in this particular system, it wasn't so much a presence of oil that was distributed up into the bay as much as it was our societal response to it, where we put out a lot of different types of structures to prevent oil on the shore. That changed. Uh, significantly sediment regimes and things in the system, but also we stopped fishing for that entire year. We had major fisheries closures for the majority of that summer. And so as the other human interventions going on in the system occurred, you see again the fish communities near these other shorelines uh, were far less similar than they were to the natural shorelines. So the takeaway from this is if you want stable, productive, resilient ecosystems, natural component, natural shorelines are an important component of that. And so that was kind of a, a, an overview of, of the work that's been done trying to understand the impacts of shoreline decisions on, eco on the ecology of systems. But we also have been working on trying to understand what drives these shoreline decisions. 
So looking back at the, the human component, what predicts where we have lots of these structures and what predicts areas where uh, we've leaned towards habitat conservation in the past. And from the, the Gitman paper in Frontiers in Ecology that focused on looking at this at the county level, it showed two different scenarios. First, out on our open coasts, so this is where we've got predominantly beaches and dunes uh, along our outer areas, storms tell the story. In areas where you have lots of storms, you have significantly more shoreline armoring. In areas where you have fewer storms, you don't have nearly as much shoreline armoring. On the sheltered coasts, it's much more complicated. And so this is back in your bays and your estuaries, like the systems that I've, I've showed you some of our work in. In this case, housing density is the strongest predictor. So in areas where there's really high density housing uh, or more people are living, if you think of it that way, there's much more shoreline armoring. So the armoring occurs where the people are. It's, um, it, it's very intuitive there. But then it becomes much more context specific uh, beyond once you get deeper into these areas of depending on how developed they are. And so this is where the thinking about these things on an urbanization gradient becomes very important. And now I'm going to transition a little bit and highlight some of our, our recent and ongoing work looking at this on a finer scale. So what our group has been really working on over the past couple of years is looking at individual waterfront properties as an ideal system to study this. Because in, a, in the time frame of a homeowner interacting with their property, they're making decisions on whether or not to install a structure, to take out a structure, how to maintain things, and then you're able to measure the outcomes for them on the social side, the ecosystem services, and as well as how these ecosystems function. And so in this case, we're considering this what's been coined the social ecological system. So the waterfront property owners make shoreline decisions. What decisions they make influences them through uh, benefits and costs. And each of these entities, the homeowners and the shorelines, are nested within bigger systems. So waterfront homeowners are part of broader coastal counties, if you look at the coastal communities. Um, if you look at the image at the bottom, you can see that the decisions that the waterfront homeowners make influence a lot of things for those people who live one block inland. They influence not only their access to the shoreline, but also the configuration of the shoreline, how much of it is vegetated versus sand versus vertical walls. They also influence water quality and fish abundance and all of those types of things. And increasingly, we're starting to look at how they influence the distribution of water and storms and risk and, and those types of interactions. So there's a, there's a lot of complex interactions going on there on the social side. On the ecological side, uh, it's essentially some of the things I described. These individual shorelines have consequences that scale up to the ecosystems. And those ecosystem level things like water quality or fish abundance feedback to benefit coastal communities. And so the system that we've worked a, a lot on is Mobile Bay down in the Gulf of Mexico. Here's your image to, to get to see it uh, over on the left. The coloring along your shoreline is some high resolution shoreline mapping with the natural shorelines in green, the vertical walls in red. So you can see in certain areas there's a whole lot of vertical wall. Uh, the city of Mobi Mobile is in the, the very top left corner about where the 88 degree mark is, and that causeway that, that you can see coming across the very top of the bay where the rivers come in is where that uh, other image was taken. Uh, what I described in, in results from the Douglas paper um, is on the right. So as people have developed and populations have grown in these two coastal counties from 1940 to 2000, uh, shoreline armoring has increased as well. And if you extended this about another 10 or 15 years, this percentage is now up to 40, 42 percent uh, in the coastal Alabama area. So populations have continued to grow, and short, so has shoreline armoring. There we go. And so what, one of the things that we've been working on within this system is trying to understand how waterfront residents perceive and prioritize natural versus artificial shorelines. And so what drives their, as first is how they perceive these things, and second, how those predict what drives their decision making. And so this first study that I, I want to, to use as an example or a case study 
uh, was done in 2010, and we did a survey of 1,000 waterfront residents around the bay and asked them a series of questions related to vertical walls, which are the top figure circled in red, which is going to correspond to the red bars on these, these graphs. The purple is the riprap revetments, and the green are the natural shorelines. And so we use these uh, grouped categories to represent uh, what was in, in this system about 97% of the bay. And the takeaway from this is that most homeowners perceived vertical walls or revetments to be more effective and more durable than the natural shorelines. However, they also perceived them to cause the most environmental harm. And most people preferred the aesthetics of the natural shorelines. So, from this set of questions alone, we identified some trade-offs that homeowners face. They recognize that the ones that they prefer aesthetics and that they recognize cause the least environmental harm are not the ones that give them this cost effective and durability. But we needed to know a little bit more, and so we also asked in our survey, how do they prioritize these things? What leads to their ranking of these various characteristics? And the one on the right uh, is most maintenance which was generally uh, across, a wash across the board. A few folks thought, slightly more thought, that natural shorelines required the most maintenance. Okay. And when we asked how they ranked these, how they prioritized these when they were making their decisions, it was very clear that cost effectiveness won the day. Effectiveness, durability, and cost uh, were in the top three for the vast majority of respondents here. Environmental impact was fourth, but it was a very distant fourth, and very few people highly prioritized aesthetics, water accessibility, permitting, and other. Permitting is one that, that we point out a lot, would vary by state. This is one that the permitting in Alabama has um, allowed the implementation of a variety of structures through time, but now it's on a leading edge of also having homeowners being able to implement living shorelines. So the permitting issue here uh, through time has not been something that the Alabama residents have been concerned about as much as other states where we surveyed in uh, North Carolina and the Northeast and where permitting was a greater concern. But what we really wanted to know is what predicted homeowner shorelines decisions? What predicted their current condition and what predicted what they would do if they could do it all over again? And so starting with their current condition, uh, we had 72% of our respondents in the survey had vertical walls. 19% had natural shorelines, 6% had revetments. And so we conducted an analysis by taking some of our previous survey questions as well as some uh, experience and demographic information on the residents and built a tree classification tree model. And I'm gonna walk you through this as, as it pops up. But essentially, we were interested in trying to understand how each of these variables or survey responses, like uh, perceived environmental condition, did they recognize that the system of Mobile Bay had declined or did they think it was in its best condition in history? Perspective on the greatest value, do artificial structures increase your property value or do natural shorelines increase your property value? as well as how long they'd lived on the bay, what their neighbors had, how old they were, their education, how much uh, income the, their household uh, brought in, and as well as uh, we divided this into geographic regions of the bay, uh, and I'll show you why in a second. And what this analysis that we used does is it basically throws all those things in and says what predicts a person's shoreline. And what came out as being the strongest predictor in this scenario is what your neighbor has. So if your neighbor has a vertical seawall, a vertical wall such as a bulkhead, there's a 75% chance that you do as well. If your neighbor has a vertical wall, there's only a 6% chance that you have a natural shoreline. Whereas on the other side, if your neighbor has, if both of your neighbors have natural and revetments and you're not touching a vertical wall, there's only a 36% chance that you have a vertical wall and a 30% chance that you have a natural. So these things are clustering. In areas where you have vertical walls, you have a lot of them. But we also wanted to know if homeowners could do it all over again, having the experience that they have with these structures, what would they choose today? 
And so these initial values of 72%, 19, and 6 were what they have right now. Within each group, we asked them what they would choose if they were presently addressing an eroding shoreline, a natural but eroding shoreline. And as you can see, within, let's start with the, the vertical wall group down in the left corner circled in red, 76% of these folks would again choose a vertical wall. 17% would choose a riprap revetment instead. Only 5% of them would go for a living shoreline. Within the individuals that have a living shoreline, if they were facing erosion, a quarter of them would go towards a vertical wall another nearly 20% would go towards a revetment. So you would have increasing armoring. This is a group that is not experiencing erosion. And so we did the same analysis here, again, throwing in the same things, trying to figure out what predicts this decision. So what's telling us what their current preference is? And it was, again, the same story. This tells that the neighboring influence is very strong at this point. We don't know yet whether it's a social influence or whether it's a biophysical a consequence of having the structure there, but we know that this clustering is occurring. In this case, actually, it's even stronger. If your neighbor has a vertical wall on either side of you, there's a 91% chance you would choose a vertical wall, whereas if your neighbors were natural or had revetments, there's only a 19% chance that you would choose a vertical wall. Within this group uh, that's very drawn towards vertical walls, in one section of the bay, it reaches 98%. And so this is a section of the bay that has the greatest exposure to uh, the highest fetch, so the greatest exposure to wave energy, and also has the highest historical uh, tradition of installing these vertical walls. And the survey involved a lot of other questions, including some things where we just asked homeowners to tell us their, their perspectives on shorelines. And I like to show these two that really sum up two different groups that we had represented. We had one group that basically said, if there were other options available, I would gladly do it if costs were made available, if they were available and costs were reasonable. So this is your cost effective group that would be amenable to different strategies. But you also had a group that said, I would fight any regulation that tells me how to protect my property. And this group was very much focused on these, this is my land and I will make my decisions on it and did not see necessarily uh, a, a role for flexibility there. And so our, our explanation now in terms of what's driving this neighboring effect uh, is that it's both. You have this clear biophysical consequence of a structure. If you look across the bottom, you can see when you have a vertical wall put in, you get increased erosion on the neighbors. So there's no denying that a homeowner living next door to a vertical wall has something that they have to deal with uh, along their shoreline with higher wave energies and higher erosions. But there's also an attitudinal aspect because other options are available and there are things that you can do. And so what, what we've been framing this as is that moving towards sustainability on, on our coastlines needs two things. It needs technological fixes, so we need better shoreline structures that we can put next to vertical walls and we can have less environmental impacts and greater uh, soci positive social outcomes that the homeowners want. Uh, but we also need social change because this opposition is something considering the clustering and the cascading effect, one homeowner can have uh, an effect down a large section of shoreline by installing one vertical wall if you don't have other options to prevent that or to break that, that chain. Fortunately, other options are being rapidly developed, and this is something that uh, has received a tremendous amount of coverage over the past few years. This is a recent article uh, that came out in Science that covered living shorelines, and this is a good point to, to note that there's a lot of different terminology used for this. I typically use the term living shorelines, but this is a this is an umbrella term that's also, you know, could be nature-based coastal protection or green infrastructure or you know, a variety of other things that different agencies use and different groups use to describe this. But essentially they all share similar traits in that it strives to keep off these hard gray structures off the shoreline, such as the seawalls and the revetments, and move them further offshore. So put out a, a oyster reef or restore a marsh or a breakwater or some type of structure to allow the shoreline to remain intact in its natural state. 
And this is something that, that we've also worked on a fair amount down in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, off of coastal Alabama. And so this is a, an illustration on the left of a series of projects that I was involved in during my graduate work, where we restored oyster reefs and a variety of other structures, such as these reef ball concrete domes, uh, along shorelines and looked at how the fish communities respond, how the shoreline erosion changed, and how generally just the ecosystem changed. And over to the right are a series of pictures from the, uh, the first and the largest scale, actually not the largest scale, that's not, that's not right, the first and the me medium sized scale of the projects we've done. This one was too large for a waterfront homeowner, but it also was only about a 100 meter stretch, so it wasn't something that you would do uh, along major stretches of highway. So this project here involved restoring oyster reefs in these uh, triplicate reefs off of a eroding salt marsh and looking at how the fish communities respond and how the shoreline changed. And I'm really only going to show you two highlights of this work. There's uh, a series of papers that we put out that really looks at a lot of the different attributes, but Two of the things that I think really sum up where, the, where our experience with this work has, has gone is on the fish community side, living shorelines seem to have pretty significant benefits for coastal fish populations, for fish, shrimp, and crabs, I guess, if you would lump those together, the, the necton, the marine life that rely on coastal habitats. And so in our study, we compared a living shoreline, so the pictures that I just showed you, versus the eroding marsh. An important point here is this is not even comparing against the vertical walls and the structures that we know are even worse than the natural shoreline. This is kind of a, an eroding natural shoreline and then an enhanced, restored system with the living shoreline. And as you can see, the bars in blue with the asterisks show you commercial fisheries and recreational fisheries targeted species that were significantly higher near the living shorelines than the controls. And these are species that are highly targeted and highly valued by not only recreational fishers, but also a lot of waterfront residents who enjoy fishing off their docks and, and target these types of things. But a more complicated part of the story, and one that shows uh, the tremendous need for collaboration across disciplines, is they have not always uh, performed at reducing erosion to the degree that they might be hypothesized or, or that you would hope that they would, they would perform. In our study at two sites, at one site, they, they really didn't slow the erosion very much. The erosion rate was very high, as you can see on the left at Point of Pines. Across a two-year period, we lost about six meters of shoreline and then um, of salt marsh, that is. And on the other one, uh, there was about a 20-30% 20, reduction in uh, the erosion rate. So it slowed the erosion, but it did not stop it. And so this is where the design of these types of structures really need to be interdisciplinary efforts with engineers, landscape architects, ecologists, and social scientists so that you, you have these things that, that meet the criteria that the homeowners expect and you know, perform ecologically as well. And so recognizing that there's increasingly there's increasing options available to homeowners. There's new strategies that they can try. We continue to study the, the social side of the system as well. And this is uh, some very quick results from a recent survey where we went back to the homeowners and tried to look at another step of their decision making to what would happen if they had a living shoreline alternative to consider to replace their vertical walls. And so if you remember from the previous one, it was only five or six percent that if they're vertical, if they needed, a, if they currently had a vertical wall that would have gone to the natural shoreline. In this case, we want to see what that group still looks like two or three years later, as well as how uh, incentives could possibly change this lack of enthusiasm or lack of buy-in. So our first question looked at uh, how likely are homeowners to replace their bulkhead with a natural shoreline if it was no longer maintainable after a storm. And so this at the time was what we considered the most common context where a homeowner might go from the image you see on the left, where you can see his, his vertical walls kind of starting to break down, to the scenario on the right. 
it's unlikely to motivate this homeowner to come in and spend a bunch of money to rip this out. However, in an area that's pretty storm prone, these structures are heavily damaged often. And then at that point, what could you do to get them to, to consider the image on the right? So in this scenario, what we found was only 18% were willing to do it. This is a significant jump from the group three years ago, but 58% are unlikely, 24% were uh, undecided. This time we did an online survey. So we had their response to this question, and then we were able to offer them an incentive. So we asked them in the next question, what if an environmental group was willing to pay a percentage of this structure? And the percentages that we offered them were random between zero and 100. So they got 10% off intervals. And each homeowner only got one. So they were offered one time, what if an environmental group would pay 20%? Across the board, this shifted everyone towards the right. So generally, the group became more likely. 40% actually, this had a positive effect. 54% uh, no effect, and 6% had a negative effect. I usually get a question about the 6%. The 6% of people from their comments uh, had a perspective that taxpayer or public dollars should not be spent on this type of program. So it was not an individual opposition. To the, to the incentive as much as it was a, a political view. And so this shows that a financial incentive could work, but it still has 40% uh, unlikely. An important finding from this though was, our hypothesis was as you increased the percent, it would increase likelihood up to some point and then it would level off. But this wasn't the case. Across the board, whatever you offered, uh, percent base had the same effect. It was a slightly positive effect. And this was important to tease apart through our comments and our follow-up calls. And basically what we found here was the amount of money that it costs to restore or make a shoreline decision from a homeowner who has a one to two million dollar home is not a tremendous amount of money. But the fact that some other organization or someone is willing to also step in with you and say, we're involved in this testing or this new structure, they didn't necessarily feel as alone in that new venture of moving towards the living shorelines. So that was very valuable towards some of our uh, colleagues at the Nature Conservancy who are currently planning to design and implement this type of cost share program. And so from there, you know, we've kind of been left with what I, I showed you a little bit earlier. There, there's a couple of messages to take away from this. We need more technological innovation along our coastlines. We need uh, social change to get attitudes to go in the positive direction. But the, and the homeowners are the, are the ideal scale to look at this. The rapid innovation is going on. As we did this survey, I did, it was conducted under the context that, that I described, where if your shoreline was no longer repairable after a storm, would you replace it with this? But the innovation that's occurred over the past couple of years has made other things possible. This is some images from uh, our colleagues at the Nature Conservancy in Alabama where a project was implemented to where you don't have to get rid of your vertical wall and a modification can be made where then on the coastal side you have a sloping shoreline with vegetation but on the homeowner shoreline you have the you know what more closely resembles their previous scenario with a bulkhead and so this is a really positive thing that I think could dramatically change how homeowners perceive and, and respond to different shoreline types. Additionally, there are uh, a lot of tools and technologies available to coastal planners at the homeowner level, the community level, and, and even, even much larger at ecosystem levels to plan how you develop these shorelines. Um, I have a close partnership with the Nature Conservancy through my, my C fellowship that I had at Northeastern, and we've helped develop uh, our survey data that we've been conducting from these homeowners to try to integrate them into their planning tools. This is just a, a snapshot of their coastal planning tool for, for Mobile Bay where you can go in and, and play with different scenarios of habitat off the shore and uh, specific community data to try to design uh, how, how you would strike this balance along a shoreline. And so we're working to integrate homeowner level data into this uh, through our surveys. And so this is the type of tools, I think, that, that are needed going forward. But the tools and the 
technologies alone are, are not going to ma trigger major change along coastlines without the homeowner engagement. And so we've had uh, a really beneficial relationship from learning from the homeowners through our survey research, but we've tried to stay committed to also making sure that it was equally beneficial for them to participate and to engage with us. The picture on the left uh, is another one that, that I really think sums up a lot of these issues. This is a homeowner that one of uh, my former students, Lauren Josephs, went down to Alabama to interview. And you can see you know, what basically what he's telling her is that shoreline decisions are very important to him because he has neighbors who drive that commercial shrimping boat. And so he thinks about the fish habitat side of it. He throws his crab pot off the dock uh, you know, all the time when he has family over. His grandkids go down that ladder and swim in the water. So water quality is very important to him. His neighbor across the water has a bulkhead. So he's been dealing with the, the consequences of that wave energy. And he really needs to figure out, you know, how he balances all of these things. And so what we've tried to do is collect this information, this knowledge from these homeowners and put it in a, in a resource that's available. And so we've been doing audio uh, oral histories where homeowners can describe their shorelines themselves. We do virtual tours down at the bottom. You can actually stand where I was standing when I took this picture and look 360 and zoom in and hear him talk about his shoreline uh, and just see quotes. And our uh, goal for this is to really help some of this technology and this knowledge transfer across coastlines. So there's been so much experimentation with living shorelines down in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a little bit slower to get off the ground in the Northeast, and there's been a lot going on in, in uh, New England. And so we think at the homeowner level, connecting these people in different places is the best possible way to transfer knowledge and technology because it's not coming from scientists, it's coming from other homeowners, and they relate, and they know what to ask, and they know, you know what they're looking for. And so this is something that uh, is still very early on. It's an outcome of our NSF project, but we're, we're committed to keeping growing it uh, in, in the years to come. And the, the, the last thing that I have to say is all of this work um, is tremendously interdisciplinary and collaborative. So many people have contributed to this, more than just the names on this, this form here, but, or on this last slide. But um, it's, a, it's a group that we're also committed to expanding. So we are always looking for, for new colleagues, new collaborations. This idea of coastal sustainability, particularly on, along shorelines, um, needs so many different perspectives. Uh, and, and I'm, I'm excited to see uh, where you guys are going, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have for me. Stephen, thank you so much. Um, I was getting some feedback during the, the webinar about what a, a great talk you were giving. So I know the, the attendees, which was uh, one of the highest attendants we've had at, at one of these webinars, uh, They've really enjoyed this, so thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. I do have uh, one question that came through from Dave Hampton, um, and his question is as follows. Metro Boston seems to have heated Superstorm Sandy's wake-up alarm. However, the effects of climate change are on a region rather than a city. What mechanisms, funding, governmental, and policy seem to yield the most promising for acting regionally rather than piecemeal? And then, it, uh, and then as a follow-up question, at what scale or unit, you know, state government or private development, will those mechanisms be most effective? I hope that was uh, understandable. It, it was understandable and a very tough question. Um, so I, I think the, the, the closest I can give to giving it a, a decent answer is that the, the larger things like sea level rise are certainly the planning categories where collaboration is going to have the most impact because you're going to need larger scale investments. The sum of the small parts of homeowners responding and going with green infrastructure, living shorelines, is not the scale that you respond to those types of things. And, and the other thing that, that's involved in this is the, the homeowner scale generally responds with them staying where they are and, and adapting to the change there. There's likely going to be you know, transitions that are much larger than that. Uh, away from some communities where sea level rise is, is just not going to allow them to persist. Um, in terms of what types of resources are available, so the, the planning tool that I show, showed for the Nature Conservancy for Mobile Bay, they have those for many places. I'm not sure if the, I don't think it covers Boston yet. There is one for 
New England that's down in Long Island Sound. We've collected a lot of survey data for Boston, but we haven't uh, integrated it into that type of tool yet. But I think those types of tools where you can plan at the local scale, if that's what's meaningful, but also at you know the, the scale of a city or, or a region is important too. Um, the urbanization gradient in the, in the Northeast is a, is a really important place to study this as well because you've got those types of communities that are, are high density developments, but you've also got areas where you know, you, you've got much less uh, and, and a lot, they're very dynamic. Great, another question from uh, Rebecca Fricka, who is our program manager for uh, SAGE was, have you had interactions with government policymakers now that, you have, that you've come to some conclusions? Um, but, uh, so that was a question that she had. Yes, we have. So, so a lot of the interaction through these projects has, has been through, um, we've worked with the NOAA Restoration Center a lot. And one thing that I, I didn't mention is uh, another professor here at the lab, John Grabowski, has a ongoing project um, through SNAP, which is Science for Nature and People, that brings together synthesis groups. And one thing that that, that group is focused on is restoration, and particularly shoreline restoration, and it has representation from every federal agency. And so, the, you know, the policymaker perspective, I'm assuming that that's the, the scale we were talking about and not um, uh, the congressional side of it. But generally, within the policy arena of the Army Corps of Engineers, um, for maintaining their, their nationwide permits. We've, we've been pretty active in trying to engage them. We can always do more. The other thing I would say is right now for shoreline policy is a pretty critical phase. They had the uh, open comment period this summer for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers nationwide permits, and they proposed a living shoreline permit, which is a very positive step towards getting living shorelines on an equal footing with some of these traditional structures that have just been easier to to get permitted and implement. Great. Another question is from Stacy Beacon, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing Stacy's name. Have you seen any particular effective strategies to communicate the value of living shorelines to homeowners and government aid entities and policymakers? The within the homeowners, the the most effective thing has been uh, communicating some of the misperceptions. That, that seem to be uh, around. One of those is the, the, a misperception on what maintenance costs are for the different types of structures. From the survey response, you can see that it was pretty much a mix of when you ask them what they thought required the most maintenance. Generally, uh, but when you look at the actual values, so we also ask them what they spend. Homeowners with vertical walls spend twice as much per year as homeowners with natural shorelines. And so that's been a really effective, you know, piece of information to a homeowner that's considering a vertical wall when they say, you know, we're, we're planning to do this to reduce our maintenance costs. And you can say, you know, from the 360 we've interviewed or the 1,000 we've interviewed, uh, they actually spend twice as much. And so that, that's been an effective one at that level. I think at the, the larger level, the, um, the paper from, from Rachel Gitman that, that highlighted just how big this problem is, that it's 15% of our nation has, has had this shoreline armoring. And in some areas like Mass Bays, it's 95%. Like those are pretty staggering values that, that elicit attention to, you know, giving restoration and nature-based strategies a, a really close look on how we can incentivize or promote. Great, I'll do uh, one last call for any questions. And seeing none, I, I think what I'll do is close at this point. And, and Stephen, I really want to thank you again for making the time to share your tremendous knowledge with this group that cuts across a lot of a lot of the disciplines, which is really what this problem is. It's really a true uh, multidisciplinary problem, and I appreciate your your sharing your expertise and knowledge with us. And from a selfish point of view, I'm glad that you're, you're at Northeastern, which is great. So thank you so much again for making the time to present such a terrific webinar. And uh, I want to thank uh, all of you for um, attending as well. There is a, one other a webinar that's, that's coming up soon, and that is going to be on Wednesday, November 30th with Dr. Ariana Sutton Greer. She's a research faculty member at the University of Maryland uh, National Ocean Service. 
and um, you should be receiving the, the specifics on that announcement. Uh, you should have received that today along with uh, the announcement about Stephen's webinar, but there will be a follow-up as well. So November 30th, uh, again, uh, we'll be announcing the specifics, the specifics of that soon, and thank you for attending today, and thanks again to Stephen. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure.